Hi guys, as we used to say back in India, all is well. I'm back. So um, thanks, Kyler. Um, you know, these are these things are, are unexpected. It's okay. We are okay now. So I'm gonna go straight into the talk now. So um, I'm gonna talk about the the title is the KV71 um HMink and the KV7273 Cube SA development. And I you can see two names in there in the in the title. The Das Zhang is the one who collected the data, and I am presenting his data. And we are from St. Charles, Missouri. And people who don't know anything about it, you know, we are like 10 miles west of uh, the famous landmark of the St. Louis Arch. And I just want to talk about a little bit briefly about our site. Uh, we're not only the ion channel here, we have the ADMI and toxicology and phenotype screening as well as the um, uh, oncopanel screening. So we are, a, we are a big group in there. You know, obviously we talk to each other and share ideas and things like that. So it is an amazing young group and we, we all have a lot of fun. Um, so uh, Skylar, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, uh, the outline for my talk is the, um, you know, um, as listed here, a little bit of background about the KV7 and then the KV7 degradation by G protein coupled receptors through the um, adrenergic receptors and then the control of smooth, smooth muscle function. And then I briefly talk about the uh, the expression and function of isoform specific K7 channels and cell venous and lung cells, uh, and lung cells, I'm sorry. And then um, uh, I will di uh, dive into the, the, the main part of my talk about the KV7 validation, uh, the part of uh, SIPA uh, assay, you know, uh, from the uh, the work we did with the FDA. And then I will talk about the KB72 and 73 assay in Q. A little bit about my uh, the background. I've been here with uh, Eurofins for about 12 years. And before that, I've been 10 years with Pharma. So I am very intricately linked to the development of a high throughput screening. So uh, I know how the things are developing, how better it is getting for the KB7 channel in this case. So that's what I will be talking about more uh, in detail. So uh, Skylar, next slide, please. Yeah, the KV7 channels, you know, uh, they are only one homologous domains, like unlike the, the NAV and, and, and calcium. So they have to come together. Four of them have to come together to form a channel. So that could be either homomer, like a KV7-1 or KV7-4 or KV7-2 and 7 3 alone. But most of the time in the body, they are uh, they are as heteromers, KV7-2, 7 or KV7-4 and 7-5. And this is the uh, the classical M current, and they are very highly regulated by the uh, G protein couple receptors. And uh, if you hit the button, you will see, uh, yes, uh, the distribution of the tissue distribution of the KV7 channels, you know, the five um, uh, five uh, subtypes. And you can see the KV7-1 uh, mainly expressed in heart and who are in pharmacology. We very well know about this. And any defect in this, um, you know, it's represented as a cardiac arrhythmia. KV7273 is mostly expressed as a heteromer in the central nervous system, as well as the smooth and muscle, uh, skeletal muscle cell. So uh, the uh, the channel of the for these uh, two subunits is more like uh, benign familial neonatal seizures, and the KV74 mostly present in the you know the hearing apparatus of the body. And if any defect, it's you know, it's represented as the deafness. And the 7.5, um, mostly as KB7.4 and 7.5 is presented, you know, is uh, um, the defect is represented as a, as a hypertension. So, um, Skylar, please, next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly remind the audience about the, the KB7 role in regulating um, the contractile state of the smooth muscle. Um, the, if you can see, there are two panels, you know, the top panel and the bottom panel. The bottom panel says about the, the normal stage of the blood vessel and the on the left-hand side is the when the KV7 channels are active and the, the right-hand side is the, you know, the KV7 channels are uh, inactive. Let me go through briefly in this, um, uh, um, on the top panel, when the better adrenergic uh, receptor is active, it activates the KV7 channels and the K potassium ions flow out of the uh, um, the intracellular milieu into the into the external solutions. That means removing positive charge. Uh, that means you know bringing more. You know they are getting repolarized, 
And uh, when you repolarize the membrane, the calcium channels quiet down, they stop working, and then the, um, the, the, vessel, and the vessel becomes more relaxed. On the other hand, you know, if you look at the, the alpha adrenergic receptor, they work through the protein kinase C mechanism, which inhibits the uh, potassium KV7 channels. So when the KV7 channels are inhibited, the, the repolarization is stopped and it becomes more, the membrane becomes more depolarized and the calcium channels become more active and then the calcium flows in, activates the um, sarcoflamous endoplasmic reticulum, you know, um, calcium uh, reservoir and that um, triggers the contraction and that's what you see on the, on the right hand side, the vessel being contracted. So these are the critical mechanism of KV7 role in regulating the contractile state of the smooth muscle. With this in mind, I want to go to the next slide. Uh, Skylar, yes. So a group from uh, England has published a review a long back, very nice review about what they looked at is the KV7 activators. And we all know radicabin and flipatin, they are the chemical equivalent of each other and various other things. And the key is left on the right next to the, uh, the body. And you can clearly see the airways and the vasculature are very heavily modulated by the KB7 activators in addition to the gastrointestinal as well as bladder and uterus. So, so what does it tell us? It tells us that the KB7 models are very good appropriate candidates for an effective therapy for cerebral vasospasm, cardiovascular risk, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, obesity and lung injury. In the lung injury, it is more about, you know, it's a, the effect is twofold. You know, the, the blood goes in into the lung to exchange the oxygen, you know, the, the non-oxygenated blood uh, to exchange with the oxygen and then dump out the carbon dioxide. So the effect is twofold in there. So it's like a, a what do we say here in the U.S., a double whammy. So, um, so let's, next, let's go to the next slide. Skylar? Skylar? Yeah, um, so with this introduction, I wanted to just to step back and, uh, and, and you know, say to the audience, these uh, Eurofins have been offering KV7 channels for the last 10, 15 years, you know, starting from the KV71 mink, 7273, 7375, 74, and 74 and 75. When I started 12 years back, we used to run this in, uh, you know, uh, Ironworks Quattro which is, uh, again, in a uh, population patch clamp with the uh, perforated uh, patch clamp. And, um, and now I have seen from that to keep, you know, patch, um, patch express, uh, cube patch, and cube. And I'm going to talk to you about why we like cube so much with this ion channel validation. So um, the next, next slide, please, Skylar. Yeah, this is the cube, hi cube highlights, and everybody knows about this who are in here. Um, that's the cube we have in our hand, 384 independent wells and uh, good seed quality, very easy to work with and very high throughput screening and powerful analysis and da 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 da, da. So um, next slide, please, Skylar. Yeah, this is the uh, KV71, I mean, the KCNQ mink as a, as a part of the SIPA validation in cube. And you can, and I have, I have two, three panels here. And the left panel is a screen grab of the of the whole 384 well. And the right hand, the right panel is the two, you know, wells I have highlighted. So you can see that 384 well, great success, um, excellent seal, excellent current that speaks to the machine as well as the cell line we have. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, you know our expertise in design channels as well as the assay. Uh, but we also have a very stringent quality asset, quality control parameters. That's why we, you, you can see these um, um, some of the wells being highlighted with red. But um, having said that, this assay was 85% success. I mean, I can take this any day, you know, 85% success for the KV7 mink. This is one of the ion channels. This is uh, more like a calcium 1.2, um, notorious for rundown. And, and that's what I, I'm going to explain in this in this right hand panel. The top panel is the you know the um, vehicle control, the time matched vehicle control. So we ask uh, ourselves a critical question that if you don't add the compound, but add just the vehicle control, the 0.3% GMSO, five times, 
how does the channel behave? And that's the B15. You can see that there is about a little bit of rundown, maybe 20%, but compared to the bottom one where we have added chromolol, uh, starting from 0.3 micromolar to uh, 300 micromolar, as a clear cut uh, concentration dependent inhibition of the KC and KV1 7.1 current. So um, this is um, well established that this experiment is, works great in our hand in cube and uh, tremendous uh, trem uh, vehicle control as well as the concentration dependence. So Skylar, next slide please. So what I talked about the, the chromonol assay um, concentration dependence is given on the on the left hand side, and the graphical representation is given on the on the right hand side. So the uh, with an estimation of um, IC50 value about 15.2 micromolar, as close to what you used to get about you know in the manual. Uh, I'm sorry, in um, Quattro as well in, in Patch Express or in Cube Patch about 10 micromolar. So this is as good as it goes. And these are all, uh, you know, as I, um, uh, as I mentioned, these are um, multi-hole experiments. There are a lot of cells in there. So this is as good as it gets uh, for the KV7 assay validation. So in the next slide, uh, Skylar, yes, this is the, um, the time matched vehicle control, uh, six-point validation. Um, I just want to point out a six-point validation for a KV7-1 15 years back when somebody says you will be laughing at them. but here he goes in um, in cube and as well as with our good cell, we have this assay in control. We have about 20% rundown, maybe 22, 25. That's um, that's great. We have and um, and the time edged vehicle control gives a, a very good understanding of your your um, IC50. Any rundown in the um, in the current will have an amplification of your IC50. So we take pride in in communicating to our customers that our quality control of uh, time matched vehicle control is, as, is very good and they can trust the IC50 values. So Skylar, please, next slide, please. Yeah, here I'm switching gears and going talking to you about the KV7273. Um, unlike uh, other KV7 families, KV71 does not get activated by the um, um, pedigabin or flupatin. The only the other uh, four subunits get activated. So, so we haven't even tried about the KV71 because it's, it's, it's in the literature um, very well established. So we wanted to talk about uh, the KV7273 here, and we wanted to validate uh, this starting with the agonist, obviously with the radigabin. So on the right hand side, you can you can see the time edge vehicle control, and this is being held at minus uh, I think it's a minus 30 uh, millivolt activation. Test pulse, and the current amplitude coming from the whole cell is about. You know, I mean, on the uh, multi-hole uh, assay is about one nanogram. And then when we start adding the gadigabin, you can see the bottom blue one is the vehicle control as we sequentially add um, to this uh, to this particular well, the same well, uh, different you know increasing concentration of gadigabin. You can see clear cut increase in you know in in the KV seven two seven three. Uh, current, amazing, amazing run. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you the uh, representative Skylar. Yeah, this is the time course of the same wells, um, but the ready cabin uh, exposed as well as the time edged vehicle. You can see the time edged vehicle very stable. On the other hand, even you add the ready cabin with the increasing concentrations by about 10 micromolar reaches the steady state, and then it, it, it just hangs around there. So. Uh, this is the way to convince us, as well as to to our cust you know to the rest of the um, to the customers that we have a they have a, a solid assay of the agonist assay. The next slide, please, uh, Skylar. So uh, we uh, uh, plotted out the data from two different experiments. So in the first, in the, uh, the left-hand panel, the IC EC50. I'm sorry, EC50 about 0.86 micromolar. This is this is it is the same as what you used to get for a uh, manual patch clamp, um, 800 nanomolar. I mean, it, it is unbelievable, you know, what you get here with this cube. And then the next experiment is 1.3 micromolar. And then one thing we want to talk, I want to talk about briefly about is, you know, we not only do the Z factor for each assay per day, as you say, but we run this Z factor over the 
the time over well, the uh, the days we run for the last you know few weeks, months, and years. So we have a keep an eye on it how the assay is performing in our hands over the course of the time period. So we have a, a better control on things, not for a particular day, but for the the whole um, the history of the runs, and we know what's going on. So the next slide, Skylar. So here I'm switching gear to to so explain the the antagonistic assay for the KB773. You know there are no specific inhibitors for these uh, KB71 families, KB7 families. Uh, so you got to you got to use linaperidine and as well as the XE9 and one. So in this uh, in our hand in here in this slide I am explaining the effect of linaperidine. Um, obviously um, we are talking about the. Uh, the, uh, the left hand panel, the vehicle control is the, the top blue uh, curve. And then with the increasing constantness in the line of in the current gets you know, inhibited and then comes all the way to the back to the zero. Compared to that, the time waste vehicle control, the you know, sequential addition of six vehicle control, you do see about 20% about um, current rundown. And the next slide, please, Skylar. Yeah, this is the the uh, the long term time uh, uh, time course of these the same experiments I saw in the previous slide. See the line of protein. You can see uh, a stable baseline, three additions. That's what we do: uh, three additions to get uh, establish a baseline, and then two additions of each concentration. And you can see a clear cut uh, dose uh, do a concentration dependent uh, um, um, increase in inhibition, almost reaching the um, zero percent inhibition compared to the time edge to vehicle control where there is about about 20 percent rundown so skylar please next slide, please so this is the graphical representation of the uh, previous slide and the ic50 is about about 60 micromolar and you know people who are very familiar with this kind of assay that we know that we are testing at 20 uh, 20 millivolt not at minus 30 millivolt we tested for the agonist current and and we have you know the ic50 is a little bit high in our hand and we know that why because this line of protein and the xc 9 and one is is very highly state dependent i don't want to go in more details but the you know the state dependent will increase the potency of it and that's what i'm going to talk about in the next slides uh skylar uh, next slide please so so far i talked about the kb71 and 773 with the test pulse of one second here we have uh, we have so we have we are, we are showing the data for a five second uh, test pulse you know this is only possible in many branch clamp uh, not in you know any other uh, uh, high throughput platform only in cube you can see such a clear cut you know five second test pulse holding a steady state you know the green uh, uh, bar at the end that's where we measure the current of uh, the steady state current and the one uh, the blue uh, trace at the bottom is the line of protein at about uh, about three or ten micromolar i'm not clear uh, which concentration i'm here showing here and it, it shows uh, uh, much more severe uh, much more inhibition than i have shown in the one second test pass so that's that's what it is just state dependent so Skylar, I'm going to, yes, thank you. So here uh, um, I have shown the two examples of line of protein as well as the XE9 and one. Um, as I explained earlier, we add three additions of vehicle control to establish that the baseline is stable. And then in the line of protein, I asked, I, and we added three micromolar. And you can see it, it is slow and you know, it reached steady state about after 10 minutes. It may even go more than 10 minutes, but you know um, you always have to um, to find out you know in the interest of uh, efficacy and time and everything else what point you're going to take you know take uh, to give the best out of the machine as well as the cells. And here we, we went up with the 10 minutes, and you can see at 10 minutes the line of written uh, three or 10 three micromolar uh, blocked about 50 percent of the current, but the XE9 and one one micromolar blocked more than um, and uh, 50 percent of the current so i didn't want to bore you with bore you with um, with all the concentration but this is more closer to the ic50 concentration so that uh, the these are classic example of state dependent and you can do that very successfully with the cube and the next slide please skylar yes uh, this is the um the graphical representation 
of the um, of the two experiments I talked about. Um, so now we can see the line of protein is close to 2.6 micromolar. Um, you know, man patch is close to about one micromolar, and the, this compound is a little bit sticky too. So you got to take with the, what you have. So with the multiple hole, you know, you have um, you know, more cells in there, and, and 2.6 is as much as as good as it gets. Um, and XE901 on the other hand is a sub micromolar is very good. So. So why did they explain uh, three different assay for KB7273? The agonist we can do at, uh, at, at sub-threshold, at threshold value uh, to test multiple concentration, let's say six uh, test concentration. And then um, the, the antagonistic assay at plus 20 millivolt, we can do six concentration, you know, just to screen the compounds to see which one they have a hit. And then we can collect, uh, select the hit and then we can use uh, the state dependent assay to test this compound and see whether you know uh, the test uh, compound have any state dependent you know uh, inhibition or not so we are very flexible and we we, we we take pride in talking to customers and understanding their needs and then suggesting uh, what do they need um, with the platforms we have um, obviously we have man patch clamp and we have um, two cat two cube patches and then um, and then um, and then cube. So the next slide, um, Skyler. So I'm going to acknowledge uh, the our team here in Saint Charles. Das is young, as I explained earlier, is a scientist who collected all the data. Cassidy Kilpack is the um, is the expert in our group for, on the cube. Christian Graham and uh, Nate are our cell culture specialist. Jennifer Wesley and Andy Cook uh, been there with us for more than 10, 12 years. Brian Cozy is uh, our technical director and Diane Worth is our site manager. And uh, finally, I want to thank um, Sophia for invite, inviting us to present the uh, talk. Um, uh, thank you, and that's it for me. And if you have any questions, um, I will be more than happy to uh, answer. Lovely data, Angie. It's always great to sort of see APCs being used so well, but also particularly in those very uh, challenging targets. So as you say, that KB 7.1 min K, I've heard people tearing their hair out over that one because, as you say, the rundown is ridiculous often. But that was really impressive. I mean, I'm not sure if you're allowed to divulge too much, but do you know or have an idea of why your is it your cell line is it your solutions is it i don't know are there some tips that you've got or tips and tricks that you're allowed to share obviously uh of, of why you think that that particular assay is so robust in your hands yes it's all of the above um i would say the our cell line our solution obviously the cube you know if you do it in some other uh, high throughput platform we never had this kind of success so all of the above and you know obviously you know i'd like to share as much as we i can share but i need to talk to my site manager and but you know um, we are here uh to give us our share of our product and our service and and people are more than happy to share our service and once they share our service they will know what kind of things we use to make it work and, and one other sort of thing i mean Clearly, from that BJP pay, uh, BJP paper, um, yeah, they're, they're really quite widespread, and so yes. that obviously means they're great drug targets. But the other side of it means that even if you've got a quite selective KV seven modulator, then potentially it may be hitting multiple forms of it across different tissues. Are there any ways, tips, and tricks again that potentially? kv7 one or kv7 um modulating programs that they can both make them channel selective but also potentially tissue selective to target the that, correct tissue that is the, the good question to ask you know you know obviously if you know the story about uh Teddy Gavin, it was developed and introduced into the market in 2011 as a drug but it, it has a very serious problem with the kidney you know excretion and things like that and uh, so unfortunately it came you know the um, the the manufacturer uh, withdrew the, the not withdrew the they stopped manufacturing the gabin so the challenge here is you know obviously you know just to think up straight away that if you if you have a blood brain barrier drug 
particularly specifically going to the blood brain, then you have a specific target for the M current. But obviously, K D seven one in, in the in the heart is not going to react. That's fine. But the other things, you know, specifically for lungs and uterus and 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 then the um, and the kidney, they are very very important. And with with the the, the lung injury associated with the COVID nineteen right now. You know, uh, it will be tremendous help if you can. There is a way that we can inhale. You know, straight go to the lungs. You know, uh, apply this um, the modulator straight to the lung. You know, that can help the people. You know, to breathe better and then get the oxygen better. Um, and I'm sure a lot of uh, our big pharma is w working on this. Obviously, they are. They have to do all other uh, testing about you know the other things. And uh, great question, Daniel. Yeah, Damien, I'm sorry. Thanks, thanks, uh, Renji. Um, Marcus Dashion from um, Yale University has got a question. What are the intracellular components? Is there any fluoride, since we like to use fluoride for good seals? Yeah, you know, uh, you, can, you can talk to Sophia and we just follow Sophia's uh, advice. You know, we always interact with any um, um, ion channel. Uh, validation, we, you know, we interact uh, because they, you know, Sophia is um, tremendous. They have a lot of experience with a lot of uh, channels, and they give us a uh, good uh, feedback. Uh, so, uh, Stacey, I will recommend to start uh, talking to uh, the uh, I say, um, you know, application scientists, and they are great. And um, and if you have any other specific questions, you can talk to us. Thanks, Renji. We're going to have to get you on more often. Like you've been singing the praises about Q, singing the praise about the application side, which is all true, of course. But uh, you know, you're you're doing a great job for us. Thank you. Um, if there's any more questions, please push them through on the uh, the Q and A panel there. Um, I was, yeah, I, I I think you pretty much answered my next one about state dependence, but because um, that was some really nice work as well. I I really like that sort of assay that you had working well uh, yeah. in, those, in that seven point two seven point three cell line. Um, yeah, you know, I, you know, when we were discussing about the five second test pulse, and you know, we were scared. It's like we're going to waste our time and oh. things like that. But yeah. when you look at that, it was like wow. Exactly, exactly that. I mean. Sometimes you push these things thinking, ah, this won't work, but I don't know, you clearly could make it work and it's sufficiently robust that you're getting some nice, um, nice consistent results from it. Um, I think we'll probably call it a day there. We are obviously running a little bit behind as well, Renji, but if you are around obviously for the breakout sessions afterwards, I hope and I'm sure that you can potentially sort of, um, you know, interact and have some questions and answer sessions in those breakout sessions.